Hello, my name is Reva Bala, and today I'm joined by Stratford Chairman George Friedman to discuss the latest in Iraq. So George, quite an eventful week we've had in Iraq with a chorus of announcements saying that they're going to provide arms to the Peshmerga, Maliki giving us quite the scare on whether he would actually use force to defend his position. And out of all of this chaos, you often hear this assertion that, look, Iraq is already broken up into three pieces, and that's the reality that everyone should acknowledge. What's your response to that? Well, it's broken up, but in far more than three pieces. I mean, that it's a way more complex thing than Shiite versus Sunni to Kurd. But I think there's a model we really ought to be looking at, and that's Lebanon in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. I mean, the characteristics of Lebanon is it had a capital and it had an army, but it was irrelevant. Power was in the hands of various groups. The groups themselves were split. So, for example, the Christians were divided in at least two families, the Frangias and the Gamiels. Uh, the Shiites were divided. The Sunnis were divided. Christians were united with Sunnis in some cases, in some cases not. The simplistic model that this is a religious war doesn't work. And in Lebanon, what we learned was that, in fact, it was a clan war. Religion had a role, but not a decisive role. We've seen that model go into Syria. Uh, Syria is no longer a place where Damascus is the capital of the entire country. Damascus is the capital of the warlord, Assad. And there are many other groups who, although of the same religion technically, fight among each other very frequently. And now we've had the Lebanese model spread to Iraq. But it's an imperfect model, right? Because whereas, yes, in the Lebanese situation, the institutions can be rendered meaningless very often. In Iraq, you still have a seat of power in Baghdad, while weak, still means something in that the Kurds and the Sunnis in particular cannot exist completely independently of Baghdad. Um, the Kurds are completely dependent on the Turkish relationship, for example, um, and their export routes, and we see constraints there. And that's a good point. But Beirut serves the same purpose. Mm-hmm. Nobody could really live without Beirut. Uh, that said, Beirut was important as a prize. It was important to be present, but it didn't govern. And I think, I think Syria is different. Uh, you can live without Damascus. But Iraq is more like Lebanon. Beirut is a prize. It is a place where you want to have a presence. But Beirut does, but Baghdad doesn't govern. govern. Uh, the governing is taking place at the clan level. There are Shiites that are allied with Sunnis. Uh, less the Kurds allied with anyone else, but still relationships. It's an enormously complex country. And what happened in Lebanon in the end was it settled down into a fragmented entity where people understood the boundaries and crossed them sometimes, but not constantly. Syria is in the process of settling down into something understandable, not what it was before. Iraq is far from settling down but we'll go through the process. So I think we should imagine a situation where from the Tigris and the Euphrates all the way to uh, the Mediterranean, in the Arab world, you have the Beirut model spreading. It's not an unsustainable model, but it's a pre-nation state model. Mm -hmm. In other words, the basic reality, the clan, the family, uh, not the religion necessarily, uh, dominates. The more we try to hold Iraq together as we try to hold Lebanon together, uh, the more we prolong the agony. But what did we, if we just take the past week's events as a case study, what did we actually see, right? We saw a Shia politician, incredibly ambitious, not wanting to leave power, who built a power base around him, clan based and everything else. Um, But the institutions held up in the face of that. We did not see the military splinter over his refusal to step down. Um, you know, we're seeing the government to move on, alliances reshifted, and Iran is overseeing that process to hold a Shia entity in Baghdad together. In the same way that, you know, various Egyptians and others tried to hold the situation together in Lebanon. But 
what we really are seeing is there is a national army. It does not control the nation. To some extent, it controls Baghdad. And we must always be very careful, I think, not to confuse controlling the capital with controlling the country. The way I would put it last week is, what was left of the Iraqi army that had not fragmented elsewhere, okay, was able to assert its control over the capital. And it may well be that Baghdad is going to become a predominantly Shiite city with an Iranian-influenced military, but that won't be true of the rest of the country. So when we talk about a, an army institutions working, the question is where? And what we're seeing is that different institutions work in different places in different ways. In the end, they'll have a relationship with each other. They'll make deals. And underneath all the fighting, there's tremendous amount of deal making of course. taking place everywhere. So what we are seeing is that Baghdad, like Beirut, is an incredibly important place. But Baghdad, like Beirut, no longer controls the country. Yes, all roads still lead to Baghdad, but it is a very long and winding road. And when you get there, you might be very unhappy with what you find. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, uh, obviously, we'll be tracking events in Iraq extremely closely. Please stay tuned to Stratfor.com, and we'll see you next time.